Dear friends in Christ, may grace and peace be yours in abundance. Through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The Bible is a book of divine action. It's not a manual on how to be good so that you can get into heaven. It is a, a book of creation, deliverance, salvation for all of God's people and for all of God's creation. Within its pages and proclamation, one is countered with the living Christ as its center. And the power which works in it and through it is the Holy Spirit, the very breath of God. I may be wrong with this assertion that I'm about to make, but if I am, I'm not very wrong. The overarching theme of all of Scripture, from Genesis through Revelation, is this. God is working to move humanity and all of creation from bondage to freedom. This movement from bondage to freedom is the story of Exodus. It is the story of both the Old and New Testaments. And the movement from bondage to freedom is what God is doing in and through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The event of Passover about which we heard in our reading this morning is the definitive event in the life of God's people, the Israelites. Passover is to Jewish people what Easter is to Christians. Passover and Easter comprise the heart of the biblical faith. They're like the, the left ventricle and the right ventricle of the heart that clings, that trusts in God alone. God is from beginning to end a promising God. And God made a promise to an old barren couple named Abraham and Sarah. And that promise had two parts. One, that they would be the father and mother of an entire nation. And two, that they would have a land to call home. When God makes a promise, God keeps it. And God goes to work in making that promise tangible, making it real. And the promise was also a promise to Abraham and Sarah's children, and to their children's children. Last Sunday we read that Abraham and Sarah's grandson, Jacob, had 12 sons and one daughter. And one of those sons' name was Joseph, the dreamer, who eventually became a ruler in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And God kept God's promise through the evil plot against Joseph by Joseph's older, ten older siblings, so that all of the children of Jacob, their children, and their children's children, would live in Egypt safely. And there they embodied God's first command given to all living creatures to be fruitful and multiply. And within a generation or two, they outnumbered and were far stronger than the Egyptians themselves. And eventually a, a new pharaoh came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph and what he had done. And so this new pharaoh said to his people, We must make a plan to keep the Israelites from growing even more. If we don't, and war breaks out, they'll join our enemies and fight against us. And so the Egyptians made the Israelites slaves and sought to wear them down with crushing labor for 430 years. The Israelites were slaves. And then God kept God's promise by raising up a leader with the name of Moses. Now Moses wasn't a perfect man, far from it. He was a sinner who had a difficult time trusting God's promises, just like his ancestors Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But remember, 
movement of God throughout all of history is that from bondage to freedom. Moses didn't free the Israelites. God did. Through Moses, God brought the ten plagues upon the Egyptians in order to show them that God's glory and power was there to secure the release of his people. The plagues were water to blood, frogs, biting fleas, swarms of flies, diseased livestock, boils, thunderstorms of hail and fire, locusts, three days of darkness, and finally, the death of all of the firstborn, both human and animal. And to assure that the Israelites of God's protection from this final plague, God gave them instructions on what to do and how to do it, so that God and the power of death would pass over them. God said to the people, from now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each family must choose a lamb for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. And then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter that lamb, and they are to take some of its blood and smear it on the sides and on the top of the door of the house where they're eating the animal. And that same night, they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with, with a bitter salad greens and, and bread made without yeast. And these are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry a walking stick in your hand and eat the meal with urgency, for the Lord is going to pass over. And on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son, firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. And I will execute judgment against all of the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the house where you are staying. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The plague of death will not touch you when I strike in the land of Egypt. And so Moses said to the people, this day is to be remembered forever, the day that you left Egypt, the place of your slavery. Today the Lord has brought you out by the power of his mighty hand. And you shall tell your children, whenever they remember this day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of the land. Did you note that all of the saving action, all of the work, belongs to God and to God alone? The people of God simply respond to God's saving action, and the result? Freedom. It is not surprising, but still wondrous, that the salvific event for Christians is connected to this same Passover. It was at a Passover meal that Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his followers saying, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. It was at the end of the Passover supper that he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new promise in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. The Gospel of John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in this same Gospel, Jesus is crucified at the exact same time that the Passover lambs are being sacrificed in the temple at Jerusalem. And when the blood of the lamb was smeared upon 
the doorposts and the lintel, which we call the cross. God's judgment and power passed over all those who trust and cling to this Passover lamb. And on the third day of Passover, God raised up this crucified lamb from the grave, promising, giving freedom from the bondage of sin and guilt and shame and death and all the powers of hell for all of those who are covered by the blood of the lamb, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. God will pass over and will give you freedom, mercy, and grace. You can't free yourself. Only God can. And here it comes. Sheer freedom. For in the waters of your baptism, God made a promise. A promise grander than the one that he made to Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. It is a promise of a future and a hope that not even death can take away. It is a promise that will empower you to live a life today in freedom. It is not a promise or not a freedom to do whatever you damn well please because that would just put you into more bondage. Rather, it is a promise of freedom to live today. Free from fear. Free of being exactly who you were created to be. A child of God. Nothing more. And certainly nothing less. The Lamb of God gives to you freedom. Freedom in the gift of a clear and clean conscience. Through the forgiveness of all of your sins. The Lamb of God gives you freedom to live today as a new creation because the old one has passed away. And the Lamb of God gives you a freedom to live no longer a life that is centered only on yourself, but rather a life that is lived for the sake of the neighbor and to the glory of God.